please join me in welcoming Calypso to our seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. Thank you for the privilege to be part of the, uh, the Berman family. It's really been uh, really important to me to be able to turn to you and other colleagues in the group um, with questions and, uh, and ideas and be able to have conversations as, we, as, as, as I work with colleagues in other countries as, as Ruth described and, and um, I really appreciate the kind words. Um, and I just wanted to say that uh, what I'll talk to you about is very much an anecdote, a story, uh, and it's um, very much based on experiences from working with fellow policymakers, people who make decisions on how resources are allocated um, in their own countries. And uh, I'm certainly not an expert in ethics, and I'm really very much looking forward to your views as to what the ethical dimensions of this story uh, may be. And uh, I've got more questions than, um, than answers to suggest to you. So um, I want to talk about priority setting. And I'll start by maybe setting out uh, a few slides why I think setting priorities is important. This is very much also based on some work we're doing together with the Center for Global Development, which is a development think tank uh, based in Washington, DC. And they've set up a working group to look at priority setting um, in countries around the world. So I'll start off by uh, maybe citing some possible reasons why <coughs> priority setting matters, and then I'll move on to uh, maybe discussing how existing um, arrangements for supporting countries, mostly low and middle income countries, in making these decisions, how these arrangements work or don't work, and uh, uh, what maybe people can do better. So, um, Ruth mentioned the Chinese reforms. We've been privileged enough to be involved in a very, very, very small way, <laughs> uh, because they're very big reforms. Um, uh, in the rural health reform, so the government of China committed about $130 billion over a three-year period uh, with an uh, explicit objective of expanding healthcare coverage to over 800 million people uh, living in uh, uh, rural China and re reducing out-of-pocket spend and expanding the package of services they get access to. So though you know, it's not a lot of money uh, for doing all these things and a lot of decisions as to what uh, is high priority and what is not. India is talking about universal coverage. You might be aware of a report recently published. Um, and part of their 12th uh, plan is uh, the establishment of uh, an institution that would help policymakers make decisions explicitly about what it is that is part of the basic package in the context of this universal coverage uh, reform effort and what will be out. And other countries, such as Turkey as well, have done a lot of work. There's a, the BMJ paper authored by the Minister of Health of Turkey describing their journey Towards, uh, towards universal coverage. And but I don't you can see this, and I apologize if you can't, but basically all I wanted to show you is uh, down there how fast spending uh, on, uh, on health grows or is projected to grow, especially in countries like China and India. So a lot more money, which I think is one of the reasons why setting priorities properly, and we can discuss what properly may mean, is important. <coughs> There's also a lot more demand. So this slide is from uh, 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 colleagues, basically the World Bank, and what they've done is uh, they've just looked at uh, increased demand on health based solely on aging populations. And you can see that uh, uh, many of those emerging market economies uh, account for a large proportion of, uh, of this growth. So in self aging um, uh, causes a lot more demand uh, of, of health services, and this is uh, uh, from Lancet Oncology paper where basically they looked at uh, uh, stroke mortality rates around the world, and you can see that many of the very poor countries in Africa uh, suffer the most, and this is basically uh, uh, same risk factors to uh, countries in the West, and the disease is very much considered to be a disease of the, of the rich, high blood pressure and, and resulting um, MI and, and stroke. And, uh, and of course, huge problems in China, in uh, the Russian Federation, and other parts of Central Asia. So uh, I'm sure you know all this, so I'll be quick, but just to highlight how important chronic disease is as well, and there's a lot of initiatives trying to, to, to uh, get this message across. But basically, uh, um, cancer accounts for more deaths than HIV, TB, and malaria put together in uh, developing countries. And the problem is cancer people go undiagnosed, and, 
if their disease is diagnosed, they don't have access most of the time to treatments. They don't even have access to appropriate pain control, so people die in, uh, in, in pain, uh, something that in the so-called developed world we wouldn't consider uh, acceptable at all. So more demand because of chronic disease, more, di more, more, more supply uh, because of additional products being put on the market. And again, another reason why priority setting matters. So got just listed a few here, new vaccines, uh, antiretrovirals, new imaging tests and modalities, and of course, drugs for non-communicable diseases. And again, what, what this is, is from uh, Financial Times, shows you how uh, the, so the emerging market economies, China, Russia, Brazil account for uh, a large proportion of the growth in, in uh, the market, the healthcare market uh, globally. Um, which of course then leads to uh, a lot more marketing pressures and increasingly uh, the pharmaceutical industry, certainly in the UK, uh, very own GlaxoSmithKline and uh, telling us how uh, if the UK continues making these tough choices and uh, stifling innovation, they will take their business elsewhere and by that they mean the uh, uh, emerging markets, specifically China and India. And uh, many companies are re relocating their R&D operations uh, in, in these countries. Um, so I just wanted to show you here, this is a slide from colleagues from the Inter-American Development Bank, and you can see this is a drug, uh, it's um, Avastin, uh, for different range of indications, uh, one of which is breast cancer, and it had its license revoked recently by the FDA, uh, for, for breast cancer because it was shown to cause more uh, harm than benefit. However, the growth uh, in markets, in Latin American markets, you can see the LAC at the, uh, 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 the end of the slide, growth is significant and in fact in Colombia uh, uh, not all kids uh, get vaccinated but the state pays for a vaccine for breast cancer prices comparable to those that uh, uh, private insurers pay in this country, uh, possibly a bit higher, I don't quite know what private insurers pay in this country. But um, again, a lot of pressure to market and to penetrate um, the market with uh, an array of new, new products. Another reason why priority setting matters is uh, calls for accountability. And in this case, these are calls for accountability uh, on the part of taxpayers in richer countries from their uh, policy makers. This uh, person here is the, the Prime Minister of Britain and the very first article he published in a newspaper that's considered to be sort of left of the centre in the UK, The Guardian, was about aid. So he's basically said that despite the uh, problems with the global recession, the UK will honour its commitment to get to the 0.7, the magic number, 0.7% of GDP uh, or going to uh, global development, so we will continue doing this uh, and many people in his own party were very upset uh, saying that that's not the right approach. But he's also said that uh, in order to uh, justify this growth and the Department for International Development in the UK now has a lot more money than it's ever had before, but uh, as the Prime Minister says here, uh, we need to increase spending, but if we're asking the country to give more, it's our responsibility to make sure we get more for it. So how do we know uh, what it is we're spending our money on, what the return is on our investment in global, uh, global development? And there's calls for more accountability on the part of uh, those that receive aid. And certainly in emerging market economies, uh, the citizens are very much more aware of what's going on and have a voice and have more, more money in emerging middle classes. And this is from a very recent article published in the China Daily, which is the, the party's newspaper, it's the, so the government vetted the newspaper, English newspaper in China. And um, basically this is, I guess, um, I don't know, the uh, arm of the state uh, protecting its citizens, but they're remarkably honest, and it's a really, it's a really interesting article, I can, I can send it to you, it's all available online, but very honest about the problem. So they're talking about these large disparities in access to services and quality of care uh, between urban and rural populations and between poor and, and, and rich. And uh, the fact that uh, treating a serious illness can cost so much that people basically become impoverished, um, the whole families uh, lose their, their, their livelihood savings. So Chinese hospitals rely on profits from drugs, they overprescribe, uh, they, they get markups from overprescription, and they get uh, uh, informal payments from companies. So the challenge is, how can China strengthen its healthcare system to reduce disparities and improve the quality of care for its people? Again, 
uh, you need to have some sort of mechanism for setting priorities for doing that. What do we pay for with finite budget that we have? We can't pay for absolutely everything. How do we make these choices? What is the rationale and what is the science behind it? So, um, there, has, there have been a lot of attempts to fix this problem, I think, of, of uh, uh, being able to make priori priorities, make decisions about priorities in ways that are defensible and, and legitimate. And one of those fixes, I think, are um, legislating. So there's an interesting uh, study that shows that uh, basically there's, there's always a correlation between uh, very poor countries that may not be very strong in terms of governance and having uh, in constitutions that are extremely uh, strong, use extremely strong language when it comes to uh, uh, entitlement. So these are two of those countries that have very, very explicit and very strong statements in their constitutions as to the right to health. One is Haiti and the other is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And you can see the language here is very strong. The state has the obligation to ensure for all citizens the means to ensure the protection, maintenance and restoration of their health. So we all know, of course, that uh, in those countries with very few resources, uh, there's very little uh, means of actually holding government accountable to that. And even if there was, government can't possibly uh, and show that this happens. You can't say that uh, you know we guarantee health uh, without distinction to absolutely everybody. Uh, it's just not physically possible. So this is a way, I think, of going away with the problem of setting priorities, saying that, okay, everybody has access to everything, and we guarantee that that's the case, and then nothing happens. Um, there's also, this is an example from colleagues who worked a lot in the Latin American region and the Inter-American Development Bank and also National Governments and the World Bank Institute. And uh, this is uh, based on uh, some work in Colombia, these figures here. What they show is um, what they call to tell us. So basically, um, you have legislation that entitles people to things and then people ask for legislation to be enforced. And this does happen occasionally, but it's not quite clear uh, who it happens for and whether what the impact is on equity and on health overall, and certainly on the sustainability of the system. So about 20% of the budget, the healthcare budget in Colombia, is spent on uh, claims made by individuals, brought to court by individuals, that are claiming things that are not in the basic package. Now, some of these things maybe ought to be, and they're not. And some of these things, there's anecdotal evidence that, uh, in fact, are harming people. <coughs> Many of these have no, have no license uh, to, to, to be marketed in, in uh, the Colombian market even, so they're used off, off license. So the question is, you know, is this the answer to basically try to enforce selectively? And we know also for a fact that a lot of these cases are taken uh, forward with support from the pharmaceutical industry, which uh, pays, covers the legal costs of those families that decide to take their case to court. And most of these families are middle class families uh, that, uh, that, that, that go to the court and are aware of their, of their uh, um, and this is what, again, I apologize, it's in Spanish, but it's basically what it says that the capitation for, uh, 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 the, the per capita contribution as an, ins uh, an insurer uh, in Colombia is basically one seventh of what the state ends up paying uh, through these uh, um, uh, exceptional requests for coverage, which completely distorts everything that, that, that uh, uh, exists in Colombia and makes their, um, uh, basically, healthcare system unsustainable. The same happening, this is in Costa Rica, again, an upward trend, uh, and there's a very good study, uh, I think, uh, sponsored by a Norwegian foundation, the World Bank Institute is carrying out across uh, Latin America, looking at this surge in, uh, in claims in courts the judicialization, as they call it, of, of healthcare, when judges uh, basically make medical decisions and set precedents. So, um, who decides what, what gets funded, who pays for it, and who is accountable? These, this, I think, are very straightforward questions. If you're running your own business or you're running your own household, you, you need to know these things and you answer these questions. But it so happens that most countries are either unable or willing to. Uh, address these questions in a way at least that's, uh, that, that, that's transparent enough for us to understand what it is they're doing. So uh, this is a um, quote from um, the former permanent secretary of state for health uh, uh, in, in Kenya. Came to Washington DC and basically asked for uh, money to be channeled more through their own people's own governments rather than 
uh, through NGOs or uh, various uh, international organizations that um, support governments and people in, in poorer countries. So he's saying uh, we would like to, to say we would like future investments in terms of how to come through our own institutions of government uh, so that it's mainstream, integrated and goes towards this magical term health system strengthening. And at the same time, this is an interesting quote uh, when Bill Gates and others came together in London uh, last year and they've uh, managed to raise huge amounts of money for uh, vaccines, for supporting vaccination of children around the world. It's a very worthwhile cause. But basically, it was, Bill Gates was quoted uh, saying, if a country is perceived not to have the money to pay for vaccines, we need to go into this country and we need to get them to prioritize that spending. So who's we? And how do we get people to prioritize things we think are important for them? Um, so, on one hand, you've got the rhetoric, the cry agenda for action uh, uh, that, that came after the Paris Declaration. Successful development depends on uh, governments that must <coughs> implement its own policies, manage public resources through its own institutions and systems. And then the reality, and this is a relatively old now study for WHO, basically found that countries have serious <coughs> difficulties in attracting funding uh, that can be used to support the health system. Staff, infrastructure, training, management, decision making, it's just not, the money is not there. People are funding technologies, people are funding disease specific uh, interventions, but there's very little money going into supporting the countries, and there's good reasons for that. So DFID, for instance, recently discontinued supporting Malawi because of, uh, 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 basically, they felt that because of the corruption, they were just completely not able to communicate with people and make sure that the money gets. So it goes back to the accountability issue, who's accountable, how can we prove to uh, British taxpayers that uh, their money is not being wasted, but it's certainly a problem. So I've got a couple of questions to ask, and then we can, we can have a, a conversation. Is there a role for traditional development assistance in uh, helping a priority setting? Um, and I think it's rather problematic because at least in the context of the UK and many other organisations like the Dutch for instance, some of the Scandinavians, uh, it's enshrined in law that the role <coughs> of uh, development assistance is to fight poverty. So this is from the legislation, the most recent legislation that defines what development is about in the UK. And it says that the Secretary of State may provide any person or body with development assistance if he or she, I guess, is satisfied that the provision of the assistance is likely to contribute to a reduction in poverty. So if DFID is shown not to be fighting poverty, then whatever it is it's doing is illegal. So they need, by law, they need to fight poverty. And there's a good cause for that, but that's where the problem comes. Where the poor in the 90s, and this is for some work that's, that's been supported by the Center for Global Development, has been widely cited and published, the poor in the 90s were uh, mostly living in poor countries by GDP per capita. The poor now live in what we call, well, emerging market economies, richer countries. So countries with uh, uh, um, space programs, countries that are themselves significant donors. Um, so you've got one in three very poor people living in India, basically, uh, and then many more living in China and so on and so forth. So where are the poor? How are we fighting poverty? Uh, surely we're trying to help the poor, but the poor don't necessarily live in poor countries, which is very problematic. This is from, uh, to show you how problematic it is becoming, certainly in the UK with its colonial past and links with India. This is a very recent debate that sort of uh, sparked a couple of, well, a month ago or so, uh, and it's been widely cited and still ongoing. Basically, uh, Britain gives India about four or five hundred million pounds a year, and the Indians are saying, some Indians are saying, including the government, we're not, we don't want this money, you don't want your money, it's uh, arrogance, and you know, what, it's, it's peanuts anyway. Um, so that's from the Times of India, and then of course we've got the Daily Mail, and Einstein is nothing, I don't know why he was there, I tried to figure it out, but it just <laughs> didn't make any sense. But uh, if, you, if you just concentrate on the, uh, on the headline, Britain will keep giving millions of aid to, to India, and uh, that says the Prime Minister, the government, even though the country has said we don't want it, it's peanuts. So it's difficult for, for governments to make the case on both sides that, that this type, this paradigm of assistance, this sort of unilateral thing, is actually, can, can work. Um, so, I haven't talked about a lot about ethics, but I think all of this is, has got, raises for me very significant ethical questions. So. Um, Ethical and practical, and ethics can be practical, uh, I hope, I know we can. So it's about maybe less about building wells and roads and, 
and more about uh, uh, know-how transfer and, and strengthening uh, people's ability to, to allocate resources effectively and equitably. So if the hypothesis is that common building institutions can help fight poverty through the efficient, equitable and defensible resource allocation uh, within countries, there is, however, a number of questions that need to be addressed, at least two that I thought of, and I think they're really, really obvious when you talk to colleagues in other countries. There's a perception that, well, you know how to govern yourselves and we don't, so this is so this post-colonialist thing that, you know, you come in here to tell us how to run our country, which doesn't go down well at all, but if you want to fight poverty and you, you need to reach the poor, the poor live in countries that have very strong governance, some form of governance, their form of governance. Um, some democratic, some not, but that's what they are. They have governments that are very strong and rich, richer than they used to be. Mm -hmm. And then there's the question of contextualizing versus building economies of scale. It's a very practical question, but again, very important, I think. And so, so can you talk about region-specific uh, uh, decision making? So, West, Western Africa working together, for example, or are the differences so important, even from a process perspective, uh, governance perspective? You can only have national or even subnational. Uh, mechanisms and, and the implications, of course, are significant in terms of how you go about trying to help out if people want you to help them, of course. And then there's the issue raised with Kenya, where again there's significant issues with with, with transparency and corruption. And uh, so, the the answer of the West to this has been traditionally let's bypass, let's ignore the political economy of a country. We'll just give the money to an NGO we know and we trust, and we'll go in and we'll do it ourselves. So, like Bill Gates said, we'll go in, we'll get them to prioritize. We'll get them. This is what you need, and, and we're making it for you. So just do it. Just use it. The problem is, of course, somebody needs to, to deliver the vaccine, and the people need to be convinced that they need to get their children vaccinated. And these things you can't just force people to do however much money you are willing to spend on it. So how, do you, how does one go about improving governance? We've had, and Ruth mentioned what I've been doing in the past four years or so, We've been sort of being completely demand driven. We've been approached by people around uh, from around the world, who mostly from ministries of health, increasingly the minister of finance, were saying, you know, can you can you work with us to help us make these decisions a bit more defensible? Why? Because I think a combination maybe of the reasons we mentioned earlier, because the pressures of building, and because there's increasingly our demands for accountability. Certainly in China, we see this, uh, though it's not a democracy in our sense of the world of the world, it, it, they do want to be accountable and they're very worried about social unrest that comes from uh, basically people don't get, not getting access to necessary services and, and becoming impoverished. So there's been a, an attempt to sort of approach us in a number of countries and donors and we've been working in different countries to, to share what we know without of course claiming that we know how what we know would apply in people's countries. So there's a lot, very much a sort of partnership approach. And I'll just give you a few examples of what we've been doing. We've been working with the government of Turkey um, on, use, uh, on developing sort of paper performance mechanism based on some evidence on appropriate rates of cesarean section. In <coughs> Turkey, South, South East Turkey, women still die giving birth, large numbers. And on uh, the Western coast, uh, the Mediterranean coast, the Aegean coast, um, uh, We've got, they've got uh, C elective C-section rates of up to 80%. And you know, the, uh, the interesting thing is when colleagues were visiting for uh, one of these meetings, the soap opera that evening on TV, uh, the, the biggest star was having an elective C-section for her first child because she loved her child and that's the way to do it. And we're all, people were saying maybe the best intervention would be to get a few of these superstars on TV saying, well, actually, there's nothing wrong with uh, with giving birth normally if it's not contraindicated. So, but there's a huge drive in terms of spending resources and the uh, discrepancies, uh, they're, they're significant. So the government said, well, what is the evidence base? And can we build the process where we bring in the payers and the professionals and some of the women's associations and think about, publicize the, uh, the information. Doing some work in China, and uh, this is uh, uh, from a big uh, wine producing part of China, the north of Beijing, in fact, President Obama went, and we went after he went. And they were very proud that he got, he tasted their wine and he liked it. So they gave us lots of bottles of very good wine, which we drank at the hotels and we take it with us. But then that's a group of British people going to so <laughs> drink a lot. So, um, <laughs> We, we, we're working with, with uh, uh, China, working with the Ministry of Health, we're getting DFID support for that, and again, it's very challenging and controversial, should NICE be working in China, should we be paying for this, and you know, all these things. But this is a recent interview that Minister Chen Zhu gave, 
Uh, this was where he came here in <coughs> New York City, and he talks about the affordability of the health insurance system and, and how they're establishing a kind of nice structure using comparative effectiveness analysis and the fact that we've signed an agreement to do that. So uh, we're, we're very privileged to be able to, to, to sort of be, be in contact with people doing this type of work. Uh, some work we're doing in, in India, again, uh, certainly the state of Kerala is sort of uh, spearheading a, a piece of work again with DFID support or priority setting. But what is most interesting, when you started this, we're thinking, okay, we'll talk to people about modeling and how we do uh, the um, you know, cost effectiveness analysis and systematic review and critical appraisal of the evidence, and we'll talk to them about uh, you know, uh, meta-analysis. And, and people are not particularly interested in all this. They're mostly interested in the, the, the process that we follow to do this. So saying, well, you know, we've got the evidence out there, okay, we want to make sure it's the right evidence, but what we really want you to tell us are things like, you know, how do you consult with people who are stakeholders, um, how do you make sure the professionals are not, you know, all paid by the pharmaceutical industry and they make decisions that are very biased, um, how do we introduce some form of contestability so people believe that, you know, the decision-making process is uh, meaningful, how do you apply the, apply the rules consistently, how do we share things, you know, okay, the internet maybe is one way, but clearly many countries don't have uh, this type of penetration of, of internet. How do you engage with those people that use the service, especially in countries like China and India, where most of the spend is out of pocket, so you're the, the, the consumer consuming the care. How do we reach these people and inform them about uh, evidence-based, evidence-informed uh, practice? So it was more about the how-to uh, uh, than, you know, the modeling bits, the technical bits. But then, of course, what we keep on coming back to is, well, can we, can we really advise on that? Can we say, well, that's how we do it in the UK, and these are the general principles that are you know, not context-specific. You need to be transparent, you need to be independent, you need to be consistent and timely, and you need to include people and show there's some mechanism for contesting the decision. Can we generalize that much? We think it's important in the UK, but are these principles transferable from our country to other people's countries? And I uh, got another two or three slides and I'll finish. So this is an interesting example I've been following, uh, Charter Cities. It's, uh, you might, may have heard of it. Uh, it's um, basically an attempt to improve governance. So all it takes is better rules. That's what Paul Romer says. I think he's an economist working at Stanford, I think. And he's working together now with colleagues from CGD and others. And the government in Honduras legislated and gave him a part of Honduras, of the country on the coast and basically the idea is that they establish a new city there, a city where the rules are uh, followed, they're getting Chinese investors to come in and invest because it's tax free, it's tax haven and all the institutions will be you know brand new, they'll set them up from scratch so they've got, this is from the website, they've got you know different partner countries, this is the idea of like that's what happened in Hong Kong you know, which developed, why can't we, we do something similar in Singapore? So the Transparency Commission, where uh, uh, Paul Romer and others uh, sit, most Americans, I think, so you've got the Legislative Council underneath, and the Governor, uh, you have the court system, and it's all important, it's an audit committee, and there's different ideas, there was some thinking of getting the Canadians to give uh, input on how to run the, poli the police, um, and uh, using the sort of the UK system, uh, it, for, for, for managing the courts, and possibly even a group like the Crown Agents for doing procurement stuff. And so really importing the best that's out there, and, and then allowing people to just come in, really, and you know, allowing them to flourish. Um, it's, it hasn't been as easy, I'm sure, I mean, people, some people feel that that's not the right way to go about it, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting approach. So. If, if, we, if we all agree the priority setting matters, I might not have convinced you why it's important. I, I guess my question is, is there a role for traditional development assistance, that's how we get our money, uh, it, to, in improving priority setting or governance? To, to me, the two are sort of uh, uh, almost synonymous, maybe one is a prerequisite for the other. And if that's the case, then does it fit with poverty-fighting objective and other objectives of, of aid? and the way we classify countries, poor, rich, middle income, is it compatible with so sovereignty and can we defend it against these accusations of, of, of post-colonialism and sort of imperialism that people uh, uh, talk about? And then how can we deliver it effectively from practitioner to practitioner model? Can we do that? Can we get people who are doing it in one country, help fellow policy makers or professionals in other countries 
do it. And I'll leave you with this, and this is, this is a new pour. Uh, I started in Athens, and Athens has been going downhill. Apparently there's places now in Athens you can't go anymore. When I used to be a student not that long ago, we, there were no no-go areas in Athens, but now uh, people get killed um, when they walk there, not just mud. So this is what's happening in Greece. Uh, in Greece is clearly, as you probably know, hurt, uh, faced with the significant challenges and uh, one of the points where really people got very, very angry was when the European Union said, well, clearly you can't govern yourselves, you're corrupt, and uh, we all know that. But, you know, we'll give you the bailout, but we will manage it. We will manage, we'll have this commission, and there will be Germans mostly who really are, you know, know how to manage things and are efficient. <laughs> and they will, they will run it. And many Greeks, including, you know, my parents, instead of, if only, you know, that would be a good thing actually, because all we want is get on with our lives and can't we just that? But when this actually came close to happening, everybody got upset and said, but really, you know, this is, and this is the Minister of uh, Finance and um, the possibly the next, next Prime Minister of, of Greece saying, well, it's about national dignity. You know, it's, it's okay, we'd rather be broke than uh, and, and dignified because it's about democracy and you had things like burning the EU flag and really, really uh, unnecessary sort of difficult situations um, happening. So, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Amanda Glassman, who's leading the CGD group, and Nurs Ursula Gideon, uh, the Intermega Development Bank, and Leonardo Kubilos. And this is a couple, there are a couple of websites. This is where this report will be s published soon, I hope, for the priority setting institutions. So this is our website. This is my email. Please do feel free to get in touch. So if you're in London, let me know. And I'll be very happy to uh, host you at NICE. Not that it's just office downtown but we can talk about what we do if you're interested. So thank you very much. The floor is open. Um, two, two observations for, for your reaction. The first is the, the slide towards the end that was labeled governance. I would have called that ethical approaches. So I actually thought that those um, bullets were more about the characteristics of an ethical approach to policy setting than they were about governance per se. Is this the only main or which one is it? No. This one? Yeah. yeah. Right. So those are all characteristics of an ethical process. I, I'm just right. making that observation. And then the, the second observation is an additional approach you might want to think about not to replace anything you said but just to add on is um, I could frame the challenge as an allocation of scarce resources challenge. And there's been a lot of ethics work in public health preparedness and response around allocation of scarce resources. And it would be very interesting to look at the intersection, I think, between the, the ethical characteristics and approaches around the allocation of scarce resources and the work you're doing on policy setting in a non-emergency situation because I, I it seems to me there's probably a lot of similarities even though you're working in a non-emergency situation that's very interesting actually both points and uh, um, on, on, the, on your last point uh, we've we have that nice uh, tried to do some work looking at uh, what happens in the case of an emergency, so the flu pandemic you know what are the rules and um, and though it hasn't really be, been systematic or, you know, we haven't really commissioned an independent evaluation of how we went about doing that, our, my, my feeling is uh, that um, though there's a lot to learn from that process, there's also differences. So people have a different attitude to, uh, you know, standard decisions on care, uh, routine care. And, and they may be prepared to uh, accept a completely different approach when it comes to an emergency, like you know, cl closing down stadiums when there's a flu, because we were discussing with the government at the time whether a nice type of approach would work uh, to advise governments to what the uh, steps ought to be. And to give you an example that's sort of maybe, uh, at least I wasn't expecting it, is that the evidence doesn't show that, uh, shows that basically closing down a stadium, a football match, you know, or schools doesn't really work once there's a, you know, things will happen anyway uh, once you're at that stage and doing this type of major dramatic interventions would not work. What the minister said at the time, because we, we did some of the analysis and produced the evidence, was no way, I can't possibly not announce I will close down the stadiums and 
because you know this is an emergency and I have to be seen to do so I can't just tell people well you know what there's nothing we can do because the evidence says it so one of the throwbacks was actually in that emergency setting the evidence seems to be much less relevant to an extent than when we sort of you know talk about the flu vaccine for people over 65 or people at risk where the evidence seems to be at least in the UK well accepted and, and people but, but it's a very interesting point about how emergency uh, situations can teach us about this type of the principles and this type of uh, decision making. Right. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, if I give you money, you lose dignity. And uh, I think everybody would agree with that. The question is, why not have this whole project run through the United Nations where it would essentially be the duty of the whole to take care of the whole? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I guess many people would argue that the United Nations don't have the legitimacy, but, but you know. I, I didn't, I'm trying to make a good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it is a good point, though, no. I, but I don't know. I don't know how, how would it work to have this type of, it's, I guess, the, the, the tension between the local and the, you know, the global, and, and, and where you draw the line, and what's acceptable to people. Um, so I don't know. Well, for example, we, we in Maryland, put money into the federal government that goes to Mississippi. Right. And it's just considered part of normal affairs. Uh, they don't say thanks to the people of Maryland, and they don't lose dignity. To, well, maybe they do, but they, the uh, less loss of dignity by saying this is their due. But equally in the, in the European Union, where the sort of economic union preceded the political union, and you know, Greeks are not considered the same way that maybe, I don't know, a rich state in your country would consider citizens of a poor state, still you're American. In, 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 in Europe, I don't think Germans view us as fellow Germans. We certainly don't view Germans as fellow Greeks. So uh, it, 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 I, I don't know, but it's about this balance again of the, the political and the economic, we sort of traditionally put the economics first. You know, but I think the European Union example shows that it's a lot more than economics. It's about this willingness to basically say, okay, yeah, we're the same state or sort of confederation of states. Well, Europe seems not to be that. <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. Certainly the first point. So, so I'm not, though I do have my own views, the post-colonialist thing was not necessarily something that I endorse, or I don't, I don't certainly don't feel this way. Um, uh, and and uh, the people I work with are not like that either, I don't think. And you're absolutely right that it can be used for all sorts of reasons, including, you know, helping the people we, we like. And, uh, and, and the second point you're making is very much linked to the first, and it's not just Uganda now, the way 
this whole of, uh, uh, discriminatory legislating against uh, people who have uh, uh, who, who are gay or who are, uh, um, have different habits to your own, for, for want of a better uh, description, and penalizing them or even you know uh, 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 executing them because they're doing things you don't think are right, and that in the name of. Uh, uh, independent states basically deciding for themselves and if you read the one of a couple of months ago the, the New African had some very interesting uh, articles by African leaders and African thinkers basically saying who are the Brits to tell us because DFID again said no DFID money to countries that have uh, 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 laws against uh, people who are homosexual so the, the, the pushback was and who are you and also you know, you're supporting uh, church uh, um, charities that are doing exactly that. So I think it's just, it's, it's just extremely nuanced and complex. So I don't know. I don't know what the answer was right. But it seems to me there's a constant a series of trade-offs. And where do we draw the line? I, I really don't know how to uh, think about that, not to mention trying to answer it. I, just, I think it's confusing. So about a week and a half ago, the US Institute of Medicine released a landmark report on the current state of public health funding and the future of it. And in that report, they called for the development of a minimum benefits package for traditional public health services, which they differentiate very purposefully from health care. And what I'm wondering is, so the other thing is, is that the federal government, they say, should ultimately be responsible for making sure that these benefits are provided in a given community, though it's first a state, then local, or local, then state responsibility. So ultimately, it goes to the, the feds. Um, what, what do you think that we might learn for our processes that's going to have to happen that applies to traditional public health rather than health care, which is what seems to be much of the, the focus of, of your talk so far? I thought that was a very interesting report, actually, and uh, uh, certainly very advanced. I'm not sure how maybe applicable, but maybe the intention of the report was not to be applied immediately in the U.S., but trigger a discussion. So right. um, that, that, that's perfectly fine. Um, I think in, in the US it's not it's not just public health, I know you're talking about public health, but many of these issues about technologies, expensive technologies that are coming through and, and, and in a sense are crowding out other things because however much uh, in America you're not supposed to talk about finite budgets, budgets are finite. Um, um, I think these are difficult uh, decisions to, to, to choices to talk about, and certainly when it comes to public health, where you're talking even more about population versus individual population level measures, and I, I suspect it will be even harder to do. So I'm not saying that there ought to be a sequence: tackle technologies first and then move to public health. But I certainly see addressing um, the prioritization in terms of technology in the healthcare package through what maybe Pakori will try to do through generating some of the evidence, or maybe IPAB who will have to do by putting a ceiling on growth rates of healthcare spending may be something that you have to face earlier than this type of population level uh, prevention, health promotion measures that even in the UK now we're moving away from that and more towards the nudging of individuals getting them to do the right thing. So I suspect public health might be even harder, though it may well be more, more important. So I don't know what the lessons are. It's just a long, long way away, I think. But I don't know. Maybe too mistake. Keeps on being a call myself here. So I um, want to press you just a little bit about what the problem is exactly. Right? So is the problem, I, mean, I get it that there may be legal and uh, national policy problems for countries that have regulations or statutes or other authorizing pieces of law that say we can only give if it's to reduce poverty, and how do we fit advice on governance and infrastructure and, and, and policy setting with that mandate? So I see that as a, a distinct problem for countries mm -hmm. that have that restriction, right? And, and how you could square that circle is not so much an ethics issue, except at the mega level, right? At the mega level of, well, maybe we have the wrong, we ought to change uh, our authorizing uh, right. that or legislation in a way that accommodates this and then making them moral case as well as the political case, why we need to change that. But okay, I want to put that to the side. From the standpoint of the countries that are asking for your assistance, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure about the problem, right? So if the problem is what the UK has developed, that as you know, 
what John points out is spe uh, we need to think of this, we talked about the ethics benchmarks for a good, uh, responsible, fair process, right? So, and it's worked, let's just say, really well for the UK. Let's just stipulate that. So you would you, you provide this by way of technical assistance. They want to know how you've done it in the UK. If they choose to reject the transparency part, say, okay, all of this makes sense, except in our country, this transparency part I'm not so sure about, right? Whoever the consumer is. I'm still not sure what the problem is, right? So what is the objection? Who's objecting to your providing this advice? And what's the moral problem if you know, countries are, that you provide this advice to look, look at this and they say, we can take 70% of this, but the rest of it just doesn't work. Is the problem for you because you get distressed when they kick out transparency and you think transparency is really important or whatever? Or is it at their end? I'm not sure. Yeah. No, I think it's twofold. The first has to do with funding, so us making, being able to make the case. That's to, yeah. so, which, which I think problem. is, is right. important. Uh, the second has, has to do with us. Yes, has to do with basically a group of people who very strongly believe in, in a set of principles, ethical principles, procedural principles, and how things work. Uh, being asked to work alongside uh, fellow policymakers who agree or disagree with aspects of that, and then, you know, how does this work in the, in the longer run? It's like, you know, c can you pick and choose? Should we be flexible and say, okay, it's up to you, but we'll continue supporting you? And, and where do you draw the line of that? Because if we really feel, and we do feel very strongly about, say, declaring conflicts of interest, and we work with a government that brings forward a committee that's full of people who have huge conflicts of interest, but they won't tell, do we continue working with this government and co-brand because you think the benefit outweighs the cost. We had similar problems with patient groups or service user groups saying we would like to have, we think it's important, this is what our experience has shown, and people saying well we don't think it is because people in our country don't really want to engage in policy making. So there's no point having a service user, they don't, and what does it mean? And so it's the constant challenge I think, uh, and may not be, maybe rather self-centered, but the constant constant challenge that because you can I don't bother if somebody challenges the principles of cost effectiveness analysis and say well oh, I don't like the quality and I want to use the DALI or I don't want to use the you know but when it comes to this type of thing I think where uh, the, is there is, is there a normative position that's applicable across uh, and we can be confident in the same but we think this is right or are things really co completely relative and you know we shouldn't care and we should just continue working and co-branding and extend processes that may not tick all of these boxes. Yeah, that I can see. So, but, but thank you. Yeah, that's a very helpful question to, to try and articulate what our problem, I guess, is from a very narrow perspective. Well, it's a huge one now for the people that are doing, for the people who are doing the work. It's profoundly important, right? To get clear. So, any advice? It's a very good question, and from, from our experience working in countries mostly in Latin America and engaging with high court judges who actually legislate and then enforce this type of decision or, or come up with those rulings, a lot of the pushback um, has been, well, the government, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Social Protection doesn't really have a process for updating the package or for making its reasons explicit as to why something is not in the package, is outside, or something should be brought in. Therefore, we as the judges, we have a right we have, sorry, a responsibility uh, to, to, to uh, serve the citizens of this country and make sure that they get things that they're entitled to because government is useless, basically. And it doesn't have an explicit process that engages with them, so it's an illegitimate process of making this type of funding decision to start with, and therefore we, the judges, have every right to go in and try and fix the situation. 
So this, this, this has been our argument working closely with government and with the judges to an extent to basically say, well, okay, what if there was to be a process that you could be involved in maybe even developing the first and certainly the appeals stage, which is sort of um, you know, outside the court, but still a stability mechanism. Would you then be willing to buy into this? You know, the process that ensures things are up to date, there's some rationale or there's a possibility for appeal. And, and the answer has been yes, we would. So our hope is, and haven't got any empirical evidence to this effect yet, but certainly anecdotally judges are saying yes, we're interested. And that's why they're also engaging with the World Bank, the World Bank Institute and other global donors, saying, well, you know, if you can bring forward an alternative, that's an alternative to the implicit and uh, possibly uh, unfair and unscientific way of making these decisions, then maybe we could step back and let the doctors practice medicine in the context of the framework that the government sets out. So yeah, very, very relevant, and there's a lot of interest from that angle of, you know, okay, if, if you make it fair, then we won't, we the judges won't have to 